Hello, it's Scott Manley here. SpaceX have gone from being nothing to being one of the dominant players in the launch market in the last 10 years. They are very much the poster child for commercial space, but they didn't start commercial space. There are many ventures that came before them. And the oldest commercial space venture started back in 1975. In Germany, a guy called Lutz Kaiser founded OTRAG. Orbital Transport und Raketen AG, or Orbital Transport and Rockets Incorporated. The company was supported by hundreds of investors and included Werner von Braun as one of its advisors. And the basic idea behind their rockets was to drive costs down through mass production. Each rocket, instead of being a single tank and a single engine, it would be clusters of small tanks and small engines, all identical, all coming off a production line and all being as simple as possible. At the core of the OTRAG concept was the Common Rocket Propulsion Unit, or CRPU. This was a very simple item. It was basically a stainless steel pipe, 27 centimetres in diameter. This pipe would be maybe 6 metres long, and it would be separated in, by bulkheads into tanks for oxidizer and fuel. At the bottom, there would be a, a section with the engine, which would also contain the electronics, the batteries, and the controls. The rocket engine was incredibly simple. It used an ablative thrust chamber and nozzle, and it was pressure fed. The valves to control the flow were apparently originally sourced from uh, windshield wiper motors, but later they upgraded them to get more power. Instead of having a dedicated compressed gas tank to pressurize the fuel and oxidizer tanks, instead they just filled the tanks only two-thirds and left the other one-third full of high-pressure gas, typically around 40 atmospheres of pressure. Which meant that by the time the propellant was almost depleted, the pressure would have dropped to about 13 or 14 atmospheres. The fuel that was used was kerosene, and I'm not talking about the high-grade RP-1 that is used in the Atlas V and the Falcon 9. I'm talking regular garden variety kerosene. In other experiments, they did also test diesel and a JP-2, and the oxidizer that would be used to burn this was a 50-50 mix of nitric acid and nitrogen tetroxide. Both of these propellants are liquid at room temperature, so you don't need any cryogenic hardware. It does need to use uh, an igniter in the form of furfural alcohol, which is hypergolic with the uh, uh, oxidizer. The engine would probably generate about two to three tons of thrust at ignition, and then maybe drop to about one and a half tons of thrust by the time they burn out. And the mass would depend upon how long these units were. The Source pipes were 6 meters long, so you could make 6 meters, 12 meters, and so on and so forth. So a 24 meter long version would have a mass of about 1.5 tons. The engines were so simple that the nozzles had no way to gimbal, so there was no steering built into a single unit. Instead, it was intended that you would have four units gang together, and it would steer by differential throttle. So they would adjust the throttle up or down on each side to control the steering of the entire unit. So even the simplest sounding rocket would require four of these, but that wouldn't get you very far. If you wanted to get up into orbit, you would need a lot more, at least three stages. And they went all the way up to vehicle designs capable of launching 10 tons into orbit. This would require over a thousand CRPUs clustered together and staged in sequence. The design called for concentric staging, so a simple one-ton orbital launcher would have four of these units in the middle, that would be the third stage. Around this, they would have 12 units, which would be the second stage, and then around that, they would have another 48 units, which would be the first stage. So these 48 on the outside would all light, and then as they burned out, the 12 in the middle would light up and the 48 would drop off. But actually, because the engine was so simple, it had to be lit while there was still acceleration or gravity. So they would be hot staging this, lighting stage two moments before st stage one shut down. There would be a flight computer in the final stage that would control everything, but it wouldn't do this via wiring, it would do it via radio. Each uh, unit had its own radio receiver and mini computer and controls, all self-contained at the bottom of the module. 
Since these were being mass produced, a thousand core monster would be cheaper than an alternate rocket designed with efficiency in mind. At least, this was what was sold to investors. There were, however, some problems. Germany, of course, had a great deal of experience with rocketry. In fact, Germany was famous, or rather, infamous for developing some of the first big rockets. And the idea of Germany developing new rockets on German soil 30 years after World War II was uh, problematic for some individuals. So uh, Otrag went looking for other places to work and develop their hardware. And they ended up in Africa, in Zaire. In the 1960s, it had been known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but in 1971 was renamed to Zaire by General Joseph Desiree Mobuto, yet one of the more notorious dictators of modern times. The OTRAG team worked in Zaire from 1975 to 1979. They did a lot of engine tests and they actually launched three times. The final time, Mobutu actually turned up in person and there's video of this unfortunate failure. But many governments weren't happy with this rocket development happening in Africa. There were stories that this was in fact a cover story for the development of cruise missiles. This was actually broken in Penthouse magazine of all places. This was likely a rumour started by the Soviet Union and spread by the French and accepted by the Americans who you know, didn't want to have any competition in the launch industry. In 1979, pressure from France and the Soviet Union resulted in West Germany shutting down the Otrag project and closing down operations. Uh, Otrag looked around for other places where they could continue their work and they found a desert site in the Sahara in Libya. In 1981 and 1982, they managed to perform a total of 14 launches from their test site in Libya. But towards the end, they had scaled back. Instead of using four units, they were using single units. The stability was actually coming from makeshift fins. They would take sections of the pipe and cut those very short and hook them on at the end. And so you would make fins essentially from sections of pipe. In 1982, there was a falling out with Colonel Gaddafi, who then seized all the assets. And apparently, Libya tried a few launches with the hardware they had, although they didn't really get anywhere. In 1983, they also performed a single launch of a vehicle from the Isrange launch site in Sweden. This unfortunately broke up after 12 seconds, and they blame this on a problem with the payload design. Lutz apparently tried in vain to get compensation for his seized hardware for a long time, but Utrag officially shut down in 1987. He, but he did continue to be seen in rocket circles. He actually uh, visited Armadillo Airspace and, you know, John Carmack spoke highly of him. He also had some sort of deal with interorbital systems for a rocket design there. In 2015, he would give an interview to The Guardian from his private island where he lived with his wife. They actually mentioned how they like to walk around naked because they don't have, didn't have any neighbours. Um, they talked about the various dictators that they had rubbed shoulders with over the years and how after Libya they had been approached by various Arab countries wanting to fund their work and how Saddam Hussein was startlingly honest, saying he didn't need any rockets for space, he just wanted missiles. They also casually mention that between the original Matisse and Gauguin, there is a Hitler original painting in their home. Lutz Kaiser would die in November of 2017, having never made his launch system work. The truth is, though, the more that people looked at it, the more it was analysed, the less likely it looked to deliver as it was promised. I mean, people have... He has been very good at sharing information with individuals, but the performance always seemed to come out below what was required. There, there were also many technical challenges that would probably make this far less attractive than it was pitched. For example... Clustering all these units together would be a slow task because they would have to get them perfectly aligned. If there was any skew, any twist, they would pick up roll and they would not have any way to stop it. The design of the tanks 
also meant that they were highly susceptible to pogo oscillations as any increase in acceleration would result in increased thrust which would feed back on itself. Also, the design didn't allow for large vacuum optimized nozzles, so they would be giving up a fair amount of performance in those upper stages to get that design. So look, it's an interesting story from so many reasons. The politics, the places they performed this, the design was way out there. And actually, I'm not surprised that somebody has made a documentary on this. And I'd love to see it at some point because they have a lot of archive footage that I'm never going to be able to find. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.